Recently, there have been a series of studies in the realm of cardiovascular disease that have been published and that really change certain beliefs that we've held in the past. And I'm going to review a few of these. The first is the TIME study. The TIME study is a study that looked at whether or not it matters if you give antihypertensive agents in the morning or the evening. This was a prospective, pragmatic, parallel group study that was performed in the UK and published in The Lancet. So basically, their question was, does evening dosing of antihypertensives have benefit in cardiovascular outcomes in adults? And they enrolled a lot of people. They enrolled over 21,000 people with hypertension who were taking at least one antihypertensive medication. And they randomized them to morning or evening dosing. The primary outcome was death or hospitalization due to MI or stroke. And you know what? There was no difference. It doesn't matter if you take your antihypertensive agent in the morning or the evening. Now, I think this is important because clinically, the more simple the regimen for the patient, I think the better the outcomes because the greater the adherence. So now I know that I can safely ask a patient, when would you rather take your medicine? And for many people, that may be the morning because they're brushing their teeth and they remember. Or if they want to take it in the evening, that's fine too. But we're no longer slaved to telling a patient to take their antihypertensive medications in the evening. Next, at the meeting of the American Society of Nephrology, results from a study on the use of RAS inhibitors and advanced CKD was presented. And this is called the STOP ACE-I trial. Again, another interesting trial asking a simple question. This was an RCT in patients who had an EGFR of less than 30, and they were randomized to stop or continue therapy with their RAS inhibitors. The primary outcome was the EGFR at three years. They enrolled 411 patients with a median baseline EGFR of 18. And at three years, there basically was no difference in the EGFR between the group. So in the discontinuation group, the EGFR was 12.6 versus 13.3 in the continuation group. There were no differences in complications or anything else. So their conclusion was that among patients with advanced and progressive CKD, the discontinuation of a RAS inhibitor was not associated with a significant difference in the long-term rate of decrease in the EGFR. So I think this is important because it changes our paradigm a bit and that you can start, stop the RAS inhibitor, reduce the need for excessive medication in these patients, and I think, hopefully, focus on some of the newer medications that have been shown to prevent the decline in EGFR that we now have available. Next is from a letter published in JAMA, and it asks the following question. Is diabetes itself an equivalent cardiovascular risk factor to those who've had a prior cardiovascular event. So we used to put having diabetes in that same high-risk category as people who'd already had a cardiovascular disease event. Well, have we made that any different? So basically, these authors are from Canada. And they did a retrospective population-based study looking at administrative health claims from Ontario, Canada, to really assess the association of diabetes and prior cardiovascular disease with cardiovascular events from 1994 to 2014. What I think is kind of cool, because I'm a diabetologist, is that over time, the magnitude of the association between diabetes and cardiovascular event rates decreased. In somebody with diabetes, they don't have the same high risk that a person who's already had a cardiovascular event rate does. So diabetes is less of a risk factor for cardiovascular disease than having established cardiovascular disease. 
which means we're treating diabetes better and reducing the risk of cardiovascular disease. If you look at people with diabetes and a prior cardiovascular event, that's still the very highest risk. And the risk in people of having another event who have established cardiovascular disease is pretty flat. So those people didn't get better. The people with pre-existing diabetes and cardiovascular events at baseline didn't get much better. But those who had diabetes alone did in terms of looking at cardiovascular event rates. So I think this is good news because diabetes itself isn't as high a cardiovascular risk factor as we once thought. It doesn't mean that it isn't a cardiovascular risk factor, but I think we've done better at mitigating the risk. Finally, there is a relatively small study that was presented at the American Heart Association and published in the Journal of the American College of Cardiology, which basically asked the question, do supplements that are often used to lower LDL cholesterols equivalent to a statin? So they compared six supplements to a placebo and to resuvastatin and looked to see what happened. So this is not an outcome study. This is a very short study. It was 28 days. But they used the placebo, and it was in 190 people with no history of cardiovascular disease, but an increased 10-year risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Agents studied were resuvastatin, placebo, fish oil, cinnamon, garlic, turmeric, plant steroids, or red yeast rice. And as I said, the study lasted for 28 days. Well. Not surprisingly, resuvastatin worked. It showed a 35% reduction in LDL cholesterol. And there was no significant impact on cholesterol levels with any of the other agents. The supplements yielded a similar response as did the placebo. Side effects were similar, but they were most common with plant sterols and red yeast rice. So clearly, a statin is better if you want to lower cholesterol levels. And my approach when patients want to take supplements is to tell them what I know factually, which basically is that they don't really cause much in the way of LDL cholesterol lowering. But if I think the supplement isn't going to hurt someone, I don't tell them not to use it. But I certainly tell them that they need to use agents that we know can actually reduce cardiovascular risk. So I think these studies really sort of go through the gamut of asking the question, when can we stop an agent? What time of day do we need to give an agent? What really is the risk of type 2 diabetes with regards to cardiovascular events? And what's the value of supplements? And I think this is interesting because I really encourage researchers to ask and answer these kinds of questions because it helps us clinically decide what's best for treating our patients. Thank you.